Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Church Beaurepair on this, this cold first Sunday of Advent. As you notice, of course, um, because we're a new season of the church year, uh, a few things uh, uh, change in the music, so different uh, settings for uh, some of the, the uh, service pieces with our music. A very warm welcome to all of you, whether you're uh, whether you're visiting or been with us many years, and whether you're worshiping with us online, we hope you'll feel the, the Spirit moving in this place as we prepare for the coming of Christ. Our opening hymn is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, that's Common Praise 88.
So today we start a new season in the church, a new year in the church, actually, and a new season. Can anyone tell me what that season is? Yes. Winter? That too, that is correct. Uh, <laughs> yes? Advent, yes. And can anyone tell me what Advent means? Yes. It means coming or arrival, from a Latin word that means to and come, so arrive. And what are we, what are we expecting, or who are we expecting? Jesus, yes. But Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, right? So why are we talking about coming when he already came? Why do you think? Yes, you're an A student today, Susan. Because <laughs> we talk about Jesus being born in Bethlehem 2,000-something uh, years ago. But that's not the only way he's coming. Because that's the past, that's history. And that's important. But the more, more important thing for us, why we can't talk about Jesus is still coming, is because he's still coming to us now. He comes to us when we gather to worship as Christians. He comes to us in our heart. And so we always need to be looking for the coming of Jesus because he's always coming. And that's why every year we, we have this season to remind, remind ourselves to be looking, to be watching, to be waiting and looking for his coming. Amen. And now we will, to, as our great Advent tradition, we will light the Advent wreath. And I invite uh, Peter, Anjali, and uh, Johan and Zarina to come and light the wreath for us. Oh, sorry. You can come up here and I'll give you the, the mic. Today we light the candle of hope. It is a symbol of God's light shining in the darkness while we wait in holy expectation for the coming of the Christ child. The good news of Advent is this. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Wait for Christ's coming. Let us pray. God of light, as we await the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, open our eyes, minds, and hearts. Fill us with your grace and help us shine as a light to the world. Amen.
The first reading is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 and 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. The psalm is Psalm 25, verses 1 to 9, can be found on page 733 of the BAS. I will read the first part. Please respond with the bold. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated. Or let, let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord. And teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love. For they, they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord. Therefore he teaches the sinners his way. He guides the humble in doing right. teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his commandment and his testimonies. And together we pray, God of compassion and love, forgive our sins, relieve our misery, satisfy our longings, and fulfill all our hopes for peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. The second lesson is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This is the word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day catch you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Holy Trinity, the source of all, the Incarnate Word, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not uncommon uh, that the Church comes in conflict, or at least in contrast, with the broader world, broader society around us. In fact, I think that's the norm, and it probably should be the norm. The Gospel of Christ tends to go against the grain, turns societal norms on their heads. And of course, this is all well and good when we think of the Gospel of Christ uh, clashing with the Roman Empire, of his, uh, Jesus crash, clashing with the powers that be of his time. Jesus presented a vision of kingdom which looked very different from the kingdom of Caesar. But when it comes to our own holiday seasons, which we assume to be Christian, it becomes a bit trickier. We Christians tend to get all up in arms when we feel our sacred holiday season is becoming too secularized, with the happy holidays and the winter parties and you know, you know all that. The fact is, however, if we follow the liturgical calendar of the church, it's precisely at this time of year when we clash most markedly with the rest of the world. Because you see, for the, the, the secular, capitalist, market-driven world, Christmas starts sometime in early November, if not before, and ends promptly on Christmas Day, after which time we're supposed to just stop Christmas and get on with New Year's and then the bleak midwinter months of January and February. But for the church, and truth be told, sometimes we have to fight tooth and nail against this secularizing trend. For the church, Christmas begins on Christmas Eve, beginning a period which lasts until Epiphany, at least, for the formal Christmas season, and even extending until Candlemas, February 2nd, for the long Christmas Epiphany season. And my Christmas tree doesn't go, doesn't come down any earlier than Candlemas, I assure you. And that's, that's because I'm, I'm liturgically uh, uh, stringent, not because I, you know, it has nothing to do with laziness. <laughs> <laughs> so while the secular world is all abuzz with market-driven market -driven holiday cheer, in the church we're languishing in the more somber season of Advent. Everyone's in red and green and, and gold, and, and here we are with uh, blue, somber blue. While the stores are decking the halls, we're singing about the Son of Man descending upon the clouds, apocalyptic, end of the world type stuff. Superficially, this may seem like a downer. While the rest of the world, and indeed our own church social life as well, 
and there's nothing wrong with that per se, while everyone is celebrating Christmas already, we in the church, liturgically speaking, are in the posture of waiting, waiting for the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ in every sense of that word. For some, it may seem like we, the church, are imposing a, a downer sort of attitude on everyone. Why can't we just join in the holiday cheer of the season like everyone else and get on with Christmas right now? Why must we sing hymns in Advent which focus on this longing, yearning, expectant waiting? And then when the rest of the world is sick and tired, maybe even hung over from Christmas, only then we can pull out the joyful Christmas songs. The contrast between these two, between this, these parallel seasons of church's advent and the secular holiday season, uh, is quite telling. The secular and honestly commercial holiday season seeks to start Christmas festivities as soon as possible to extend the, the shopping season uh, as long as we can. And because Christmas has to end on Christmas Day, it can only extend earlier and earlier. I wouldn't be surprised if they would like to extend it to September or earlier than that. But once Christmas Day arrives, the merchants don't care about us anymore. We've spent our money and opened our gifts, and there's no use prolonging the season. This attitude is in sharp contrast with the expectant season of Advent. Advent is a season of waiting, expecting, and looking for something, or more accurately, someone that is coming but not yet here. We mourn in lonely exile, as this, this great ancient hymn uh, we just sang expresses it. It's not cheery, but it honestly expresses our state living in this world. In Advent, we are waiting and looking for the coming of Christ. The coming of the babe at Bethlehem, yes. The coming of Christ in our hearts and lives right now and here. And the coming of Christ at the fulfillment of God's plan, however we understand that. Honestly, after Christmas is over, Christmas Day, whatever, I often feel depressed. There's so much build-up, so many festivities in the weeks preceding Christmas, and then suddenly, it's over. And the commercial world just expects us to turn it off and get on with New Year's and business as usual. Get those Christmas decorations down before, before New Year's. But this is the opposite of what we as Christians are supposed to experience. Advent represents our exile, our wandering in this, in this dark world, our suffering, our anxiety, our wandering in the desert. And Christmas, by contrast, represents that heavenly banquet, the kingdom of God realized, us sitting at the table with the risen Lord. Our Christmas season of spending and consumption leaves us empty and depressed. Whereas the coming of Christ, in all senses of the word, should bring an end to our lonely exile. So in contrast with the bright, shiny, secular holiday season that's now just revving up, in the church we start the season of Advent with some heavy imagery. Indeed, apocalyptic, apocalyptic inner imagery. Now, you've probably heard me say before that the, the biblical word apocalypse in Greek doesn't necessarily mean cataclysm, cataclysm, but rather revelation. That's what apocalypse means, this revelation. Revelation about the fulfillment of the divine plan. In today's gospel, we heard one of those apocalyptic passages we normally encounter at this time of year. The, pa the passage opens with classic apocalyptic Im imagery. Signs in the heavens, roaring seas, the powers of the heavens shaken, foreboding among the people of the earth. 
And then for the final act, the Son of Man comes descending upon a cloud. This is great material for a Hollywood film. It's big, it's exciting, it's terrifying and awe-inspiring, all at once. And it's very clear cut, There's, this is a spectacular event. Now perhaps I'm a bit pessimistic or cynical, but I think there's a certain human inclination to fixate on the negative rather than the positive, unfortunately. Case in point, I wonder how many of you found your attention drawn to the more frightful imagery in today's gospel passage rather than the more hopeful imagery, because they're both there. For me, when I first glanced through the reading, I fixated on the image of foreboding and other fearful imagery. And I barely even noticed the part about the fig tree. Jesus likes talking about fig trees. There's several episodes where he talks about fig trees. But it's this short parable of the fig tree which puts the preceding verses with all the foreboding and whatnot into perspective. On one hand, the coming of the kingdom is, yes, a dramatic event, with the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Yet on the other, it's like the greening of trees in spring. Well, which is it? Those are not the same images. They're very different and have very different connotations. A tree doesn't become green all of a sudden. It, it becomes green gradually over a period of days and weeks. There's clearly a time when we remember that the tree is leafless, and there's clearly a time when the tree is fully green, and there's some intermediate stages, but we don't actually perceive the, the, the greening of the tree, because it happens slowly and gradually. So why these contrasting images? The key, I think, is the word images. This is not uh, meant to be a crystal ball-like prediction of how some future event will actually look. These are images in limited human language trying to express truths beyond the capacity of human language and the constraints of time and space. It's clear based on the New Testament and other writings coming out of the early church that the earliest Christians expected the literal historical return of Christ soon perhaps with the same, within the same generation. As we know, this did not happen. Of course, that has not hindered other Christians throughout history from expecting, even predicting, to the time and place and day, the imminent return of Christ in dramatic fashion. Yet all predictions thus far have failed and are probably bound to fail. But I wonder if our fixation on the historical and literal has not led us away from other layers of meaning in Jesus' apocalyptic discourses. Maybe if we keep looking to the heavens, expecting the Son of Man to descend in a cloud, we may miss the signs of the kingdom right here, suddenly, in our midst, coming around us, within us, among, amongst us. If you were paying attention during children's time, you'll remember that the word advent means coming or arrival, which makes sense since this, during this time, we, in the time of the year, we anticipate the coming of Christ, the coming of the babe of Bethlehem and the return of the risen Lord. The Greek word that this translates, because advent is a Latin word, a word that's used throughout the New Testament and it's consistently used for what we call the second coming. You've heard that expression. It's the word parousia in Greek. But the meaning of the word parousia is broader than the word just coming or arrival. The range of meaning includes both coming and presence, both coming and presence at the same time. But perhaps this ambiguous meaning of the word parousia says something about the nature of Christ's coming. The popular notion of a cataclysmic sort of second coming event somehow implies that Christ is presently absent 
and that Christ has withdrawn from the world. But wouldn't that deny the significance of Pentecost? Wouldn't that deny Christ's presence in the church right now and in our own hearts? Perhaps this parousia, the coming and presence of Christ, is not so much or just a future event in history, as much as it is a reality that's already begun, even if not fully realized, right here in our midst, right now. Amen. Let's stand and confirm the faith, affirm the faith of our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, as we begin this season of Advent, we ask that you prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of our Lord. Help us to share the blessings that you have given us with the needy, the lonely, and those suffering illness or grief. As you sent your messenger John to prepare for Christ's coming, let us be your messengers today, sharing the news of the greatest gift given to mankind. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our world, filled with war, hatred, famine. We ask for your compassion on all refugees and those dispossessed. We pray for the women and children in particular of Afghanistan. Grant them all safety and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our world seems more and more divided by politics, race, beliefs, understanding of science. We pray that we can open ourselves to listen and to hear one another. Let our eyes and our hearts see each person as our brother and sister. Fill us with compassion for all people and the desire to do your will, that the earth may be filled with peace for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for those suffering the effects of natural disasters and in particular for those in BC who are suffering the loss of loved ones, homes, lands, and livestock. Grant them courage and strength. Lord, we do trust in you, but we are your hands and feet in the world, and we must do our part. We give thanks for the work done internationally on climate change. We pray that the leaders can somehow look beyond their borders to see the needs of the whole world. Lead us each to ask, act responsibly, working together to heal and protect the world you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Within our parish family, we pray for June Perry, Jane Parsons, and Emmett and Judith Pearson. 
and also for the Mission and Ministry Group, the Holy Trinity Methodist Church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all who are sick, in distress, or in need of any kind. And we especially commend to you, Deirdre, Nancy, Gordon, Art, Laura, Lisa, Colleen, Elena, Anne, Gloria, Sandy, Karen, Trish, Andrew, Eleanor, Mary, Irene, and Romy. Father, we pray that you give them comfort and hope, give strength and rest to their families and caregivers, and discernment to the doctors. And now I invite you to kneel either aloud or silently, any on your hearts. We pray for your love and comfort for those who are suffering bereavement. Be with Irene Chabukowski, Ingrid and Gordon Gillis, Owen Morgan, Sherry and Phil Hertes, Ronald, Sandy and Ian Temple, Nancy, Larry, Jeff, and Andy Dole, Cedric Cobb, and Thomas D'Souza. And Father, we lift them up to you, giving, ask that you give them your comfort at this time of grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, during this busy time of preparing for Christmas, for our celebrations, let us always remember with the help and guidance of your Holy Spirit, we walk in the footsteps of your Son to accomplish your will in the world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please share a sign of the peace of Christ with your neighbor at a distance or on, on the, in the comments section.
Let us pray. God of love and power, your word stirs within us the expectation of the coming of your Son. Accept all we offer you this day and sustain us with your promise of eternal life. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, sustainer of the universe. You are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will they were created and have their being. Glory to you forever and ever. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of your creation. Glory to you forever and ever. But we turn against you and betray your trust, and we turn against one another. Again and again you call us to return. Through the prophets and sages you reveal your righteous law. In the fullness of time you sent your Son, born of a woman, to be our Savior. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. By his death he opened to us the way of freedom and peace. Glory to you forever and ever. Therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn as we sing. Now and forever. 
Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray as we sing.
God for whom we wait, you have fed us with the bread of eternal life. Keep us ever watchful that we may be ready to stand before the Son of Man. We ask this in the name of Christ the Lord. Amen. And together we pray. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Be steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and untiring in love all the days of your life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Announcements and should be come of no surprise to you that there are quite a few because we're getting to that time of the year. Uh, first of all, this Friday uh, will be will be the return of our of our traditional wassail uh, sing along at seven o'clock p.m. with a uh, a modest reception following, possibly before. You know, I think it's kind of ironic that I just berated the, the, the secular holiday season now we're, and I'm inviting you to this, but <laughs> let me be clear, I'm not uh, against celebrating Christmas now, it's rather I'm against stopping it on December 25th. It should extend beyond that. So at 7 o'clock, there's no limit on the number of people in the church for the sing-along, uh, practically. Uh, but we're only allowed to have 25 people in the hall eating at one time. So we, uh, we have to have pre-registration, but we're considering adding a, a second one, a second session, a, a cocktail, if you would, uh, before. So if there is demand, but so far, very few people have registered. I think there was like four this morning. So uh, please don't do this uh, nice uh, Canadian thing, you know, uh, no, after you, I want to give my place to someone else. Because if you do that, we're going to be, there are going to be five of us down there drinking wine for 25 people. And, you know, sounds fun, but it probably won't be pretty the next day. So uh, please sign up uh, and invite friends, family, uh, don't hesitate. And invite people uh, freely to the sing-along because, like I said, it's a community event. Not a, it's not a church service. It's just a fun event. Okay, Christmas baskets. Uh, this year we'll be supporting 10 families in need. Uh, that's 30 people total. With grocery store gift cards and a small gift for each family member. For the next few weeks, we'll be accepting donations made out to Christ Church Borough to pay for the grocery store gift cards. And please mark your donation, Attention Christmas Baskets. Also, uh, there be a, but there's, a, this is the, there's the gift card for groceries, and there are individual gifts for the family members. And in the narthex, there's a basket of gift tags with a name, gender, and age of the family member that needs a gift, along with a sign-up sheet. Please return all gifts to the church by Sunday, December 12th, which will come before you know it. So that's two weeks from today. The gift baskets will be delivered the week of December 12th. If you are able to help deliver baskets, there is a sign-up sheet in the narthex. And for more info or to help, please contact Judith or the church office. And this is not heavy lifting. It's, like I said, it's gift cards with a few gifts. So it's not like these heavy you know, baskets of food. Uh, so please don't, um, uh, don't hesitate to sign up if you're afraid of heavy lifting. Could I just add yes. a quick something, because there's a bit of a change. Um, just so there's no confusion, there was a bit of a change in the information uh, that I received from the organization that I only realized last night when I was making out the gift cards. I used to get the name, the gender, um, the name, the gender, and the age of everybody, so I could mark it on the gift cards. But uh, now I'm only getting the name of the parents in the family, and the only description of the children is kind of the gender and the age. So that's why you'll see on the, the gift cards, it seems a bit impersonal, but it'll be just marked with the, the family name, maybe an underneath daughter and the age, or, or the gender and age might be marked on the back. So um, I'm gonna adjust the announcement, but just so that there's no confusion and it seems a bit impersonal. 
I didn't get also the ages of the parents, so you'll see on the back I may just have marked mother or father. That's all the information I got. <laughs> okay, just to, to repeat that, um, the for those online, uh, the the children, the gift tags for the children will not have a name, so it seems impersonal, but that's the way it's done. It will just have a gender and age. Um, also, I forgot to mention, for the wassail, uh, and in general, um, this is kind of a fundraiser for these, the Christmas uh, baskets, and also we're, we're trying to get our food collection going again. You see here is a basket of food. This is, these baskets are in the, in the North Ex all the time. So please, when you're, when you're heading out to church, put, some, put a bag of canned goods by the door so you can take them. And we period, periodically, Lorna takes these to uh, St. Michael's Mission. What else? Uh, Christmas, uh, Children's Christmas pageant will be Sunday, December 12th. That will be a regular Sunday service, but instead of the sermon, uh, there will be uh, the Christmas, Children's Christmas pageant. Uh, Festival of Lessons and Carols will be the next Sunday on the 19th. Uh, the choir is up and running. I think it's, uh, at this point, it's probably a bit late to join, but they're doing, I heard them practicing this morning. They're doing a great job. Uh, and guess what? That means that there's two Sundays in Advent. You don't have to listen to me preach. So, uh, and also, I don't have to write a sermon. <laughs> it's good on both counts. <laughs> Uh, also on December 19th at 4.30 will be the Pause and Pray uh, dog-friendly service. Uh, this will be a Christmas service. Again, it's Advent, but it will be a Christmas service because it's the only one we're having in December. Uh, and on Christmas Eve, we will have one service at 7 p.m., uh, candlelight service of Holy Communion. Uh, you don't have to register. I think we can accommodate everyone without registration. And as I said, Christmas doesn't end on December 25th. We will not have a service on Christmas Day. We will not. But on December 26th, which is the, a Sunday, we will have our regular service, and it will be a festive uh, Christmas Day service. So if you can't come out at night, you can't drive at night or whatever, this is your chance to have a Christmas service on the Sunday afterwards. And I believe that is all the announcements. And we end with this... Uh, Right. Yes, sorry. Just a reminder of the fun script. I would really like your orders next Monday, next Sunday, that I could, and then, and then you would get them until probably 10 days later. But I will need your orders with your money so that I can get the orders in in time. And uh, so just a reminder if you have any gift cards you want to give us Christmas gifts, please bring it next Sunday. Okay, please bring your fun script uh, forms by next Sunday. And also, please keep uh, Karen, our lay reader, in your prayers. She is recovering, and hopefully she'll be back with us in mid-December. But uh, please keep her in your prayers, and uh, I'll offer her, her whatever support uh, you can. And I'm just kind of getting a signal from the back to remind you, we still have calendars left. <laughs> they make great Christmas gifts. Only five bucks. Now we'll close with our final hymn which is uh, one of those great Advent hymns. I feel like Advent hasn't started until we hear this one. Uh, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, uh, a hymn by Charles Wesley. We had two hymns from Charles Wesley today. Um, I've had this hymn in my head all, all week long. That tells you what a, a weirdo I am. That other people have jingle bells or whatever holiday classics in their head, and I have this, 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 uh, this hymn in my head. <laughs> That's common phrase 114.
to celebrate God's love and to be nourished and strengthened for service in God's mission. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.